Welcome to another episode of Structo's Meet the Writer. This is a short form video series where we talk to the poets and writers who have contributed work to Structo 20. Um, and today, we're very happy to be talking to uh, Hisham Bustani. Hi, Hisham. Hi. Thanks for taking the time. Um, it's, it's really nice to be able to, to, to talk to everyone who's, who's contributed work to this issue. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And it's, I think it's the first time I talk directly to the editor of a literary magazine, which is uh, really? also, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, right? You, you, never, you never see the editors of the magazines. We, we actually, hide for a reason most Or talk to them other, otherwise, you know, without, you know, going through the details of the story. Outside that, I think there's a missing relationship between the writer and the editor, which I think this video series will, you know, try to transcend somehow. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's unexpected. It's not something that we've done before. And, you know, the current situation has really meant that, yeah, we, we've missed that connection. There's something, we haven't done launches for every issue, but by far my favorite part of those launches was always just the more casual conversations with the contributors afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and so in, in a sense, it's an attempt to, to, to regain a little bit of that, but you're right. Uh, that kind of connection is is missing as part of this process. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a short story from you in the in the new issue, uh, translated from the Arabic. You're you're in Jordan at the moment. Yes, yes, in Amman, Jordan. Amman is the capital of Jordan, and I live in Amman. And so it's a piece of short fiction, although in the context of Structo and in the context of slightly more experimental writing more generally. It's definitely falling in between genre to a certain extent. How would you, can you encapsulate Field of Vision for, for anyone who hasn't read it? Well, as you said, I'm very keen on experimenting on what I call the boundaries between uh, short fiction and prose poetry. I think there's a, there's a huge connection between the, do, the two genres. I think they meet um, in many ways rather than, you know, uh, depart from each other. And I like to, you know, work on that area quite a lot. So m many of my pieces actually can be seen as poetry on one side or uh, a short piece of fiction uh, on the other side. So Field of Vision is one of those pieces where you can feel both elements at work in different parts uh, of the of the text of the piece or prose poetry. For example, towards the end, you would feel it's more of a prose poem rather than a, a conventional short story, but there's a narrative line. There are two characters actually inside the piece. Um, one of them is Wilfred Owen, the poet of World War I, and one of them is uh, a reader of the, po of the poet, um, a woman who is reading uh, his works and um, actually the, 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 uh, the piece or the short story or the poem, if you want, is, is somehow working on uh, one of Wilfred Owen's actual poems. It's called The Kind Ghosts. And in The Kind Ghosts, which is a very short poem by Wilfred Owen, there's a, there's a, there's a female character who's sleeping. It, the poem begins with, she sleeps on soft last breath, but no ghost looms out of the stillness of her palace wall. So from that image, I kind of recreated the female figure into a, a state of what is called a, a sleep paralysis or a sleeping paralysis where someone is uh, kind of aware. This is what sleeping paralysis is. It's a, a state during sleep or the beginning of sleep where the person is somehow aware but is completely paralyzed and unable to move or respond to some uh, to the hallucinations that might occur. So I recaptured that person in the poem and uh, put her in a state of uh, a sleep paralysis. And in the sleep paralysis, she imagines that a person is walking in, talking to her, and that person is actually Wilfred Owen, uh, recollecting on how he made his poems. Uh, you know, Wilfred Owen is a very strong anti-war poet. His, his, his story is very tragic. He died just a couple of weeks before the end of the World War, the First World War, and his poems were published after he was dead. Uh, and uh, his poems are very strong in conveying this uh, violence of the war, the, 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 the true feelings of people, of soldiers who are actually 
normal human beings, you know, in front of this entire suffering. Uh, I think the, the First World War was one of the last wars where people were engaged directly, uh, physically in the act of, rather than, you know, high tech rockets and airplanes. And so the soldiers were themselves the, the, the fuel of the war. So you can, you can feel how tragic and strong Wilfred Owen's work on that aspect. And it kind of also relates to me, um, since I live in a region where also war is continuously present up until uh, this very minute. Jordan is part of uh, what is globally known as the Middle East. We, we, we like to call it the Arab region because the Middle East is kind of a colonialist heritage name. So in the Arab region, you know, there's a war in Syria now, Iraq, uh, Yemen, Libya. So Wilfred Owen's poems um, talks to me, uh, and I think it talks to the situation, which is kind of now has turned up in a, in a global, you know, in a global catastrophe with the with the COVID nineteen, the lock ins. So people kind of now can relate to these to these themes. So I related to uh, Wilfred's poems and transformed and kind of put myself into dialect uh, or into dialogue. Sorry, into dialogue. Uh, with that poem and with, with, the, with the mass of, of his work. And this is also in, in kind of puts you um, in a way uh, because uh, the work I engage with is this boundary like uh, kind of uh, practice. And I'm engaging with also another poet from another era working on poems. So this creates the kind of uh, work people I hope will read in, in Instructo number 20 and can also engage with and see how this works out, uh, this dialogue between a narrative uh, fiction and poetry as well in the context of a, a global concern about death and war and a reflection on, on, on these moments through a dialogue between a woman in a sleeping paralysis situation and a poet, a poet who is reincarnated as a ghost uh, in that in that piece. And it's a remarkably fluid translation from the Arabic by uh, Thraya al Reis. Yes, Thraya has been a long collaborator uh, together. She, well, we are together, we work together for a long time. Uh, she translated uh, two of my books. One of them is called The Perception of Meaning and this book has won uh, the Arabic Translation Award from the University of Arkansas uh, in the US, one of the very few uh, awards that are awarded to a work of translation from the Arabic. Uh, this was in, and, and it's available in English uh, from Syracuse University Press. Yeah. So the perception of meaning is available through the Syracuse University Press. And this was the award winning book. Uh, another book was was, was the, is the one uh, which um, this piece, Instructo 20, is taken from. It's called uh, Preludes to an Inevitable Demise. Uh, it's another book of mine that is yet to be published in English. It's not uh, yet published in English. And um, I might say finding a publisher for a translated work with this experimental edge as you might expect, and no, it's, it's kind of, <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard. Yeah. It's, it has been very successful in literary reviews, by the way, because I think literary reviews do not abide to the rules of the market or the publishing market. They actually are more concerned with the quality of the, of the work. So pieces from this book have appeared in the Kenyan Review, in the Georgia Review, in Black Warrior Review, in modern poetry and translation, in the poetry review, so also instructor as well. So as you can see, it's, very, it's been very successful with literary reviews and poetry reviews, but uh, as far as publishers are concerned, I think uh, this market trend in, in publishing, especially uh, in regards to experimental work or work that explore the boundaries of writing and the artistic side of writing, as well and also works in translation and from let's say um, uh, you know arabic is not usually what is what's, what's what concerns an english publisher is mainly translations from other european languages maybe but 
from you know uh, languages of the south <laughs> i think it's it's kind of also looked down upon and and, and this is also another challenge uh, for s such translations so this book <clears throat> sorry is yet yet to be published and i hope it'll, it'll find the publisher soon as well it is, it is interesting to see that from from the inside as well because yeah publishing interesting works in translation which perhaps have a slightly experimental edge or or cross genre boundaries whatever they are uh, I would imagine quite a lot of publishers would like to publish that but I'd imagine a lot of marketing departments are not so keen <laughs> um, it's a case of selling that which seems to be the issue um, yeah, and, and I think this is, you know, this drive, this is also kind of rampant in the, in the Arab publishing world right. where, you know, a kind of easy, simple, straightforward narratives like a straightforward no novel or the commercial, the standard commercial novel is what publishers are looking for. And this is depriving literature from its main pillar, which is art, you know, artistic writing is the main pillar of what transforms what you might call, you know, a regular narrative into a, a, a literary narrative yeah. or a literary approach. So without art and exploring the potential of art, uh, I think, you know, literature loses its, its, uh, its meaning. So this is, this is one, one, one big problem. Uh, just to return to the translator, I think she, she was also, she should be applauded for, she's a very good writer, by the way, and she has she had just published a, um, a very good short story, an excellent short story in, okay. in the Common, um, a literary review that comes out of Amherst College. So combining the literary ability, her own literary ability as a writer and uh, mobilizing that into another language, uh, I think was quite successful. Also one advantage is that I know English quite well. I can't translate my own work. I tried, it, it, was, a <laughs> it was a funny result uh, because I think literary translation has it has to have a you know a, a different kind of depth or a deeper knowledge into language and cultural settings and uh, how this word psychologically feels in another language I, I can't I can't sense that I can just you know an English word for me is, is, is deprived of all this you know psychological and historical load uh, but since I know the English language quite well I can also read the English translation and we often go into discussions about that translation. Uh, and, and this, I think, results in, 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 in this quality of literary translation that is usually rare. I, I, will, I will be unable to do that in other languages, of course, but, uh, but at least in the English language, you can feel this you know, uh, impressive quality of work uh, that Thraya has done uh, through this uh, collaboration. And that, that exact process is something that uh, we at Strokes are incredibly fascinated with the process of translation. Um, uh, Matthew Landrum, who's our contributing editor, uh, used to be poetry editor. I mean, he's a translator of, of, of poetry and uh, partly with, with that, bringing in that whenever he started issue eight or whenever it was, become more and more infatuated with this process to the point where this issue has our interview is with a a uh, poet um, uh, uh, and who's done a lot of work through translation and uh, we have an essay about the act of failing miserably to uh, to, to, to translate poetry uh, effectively and how that process works with with the author eventually to produce something which both are happy with. I interviewed yeah. um, the Icelandic uh, novelist and, 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 and writer Sean a few years ago and he said he said a similar thing to you. He is incredibly fluent in English as you are and, and said, I'm absolutely not the right person to translate my work. I simply do not have, yeah, it take, it must take quite a, yeah. Uh, uh, I know. Is it, is it a, a movement of trust to find someone who, who you can work with in a, in a more long-term way, or is it just a case of finding the right person for the work? Absolutely. I think the, 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 the translate, well, I can't stress enough, it's been said a lot that, you know, translation is another creative process and the translation itself is uh, an act of creation. It's another creation. It's a recreation of the piece. It's a different piece completely. Uh, it's another creative work that stands side by side next to the original. It's not a, the mirror of an original at all. Um, 
And I think also what um, the word trust, which you used, I think it's very important in the sense that uh, the translator must be deeply knowledgeable. I say uh, in one interview, I said it should be bicultural. So uh, a translator should be, you know, um, have deep knowledge in the culture from where the text originates and also from the culture and the language of where the uh, text is translated to the other the other language. Also, I think it's also very important for the translator to be uh, at full knowledge with the entire work of the author. I think the author is also uh, important in that sense that uh, a translator should read the entire work of the author, should be involved in what the, for me, for example, I always work with other artists with my, with my writing. Um, I work with contemporary dancers, with hip hop artists, with, um, and my translators are usually involved as well. So they see, they know, and this gives them an inner perspective about, you know, the depth of the text and how to relay that depth uh, in another language. Uh, so yes, I think this kind of trust, which means a more a deep knowledge uh, of the author as an artist, as, you know, uh, um, how he works, where he works, with whom he works, uh, his artistic output in different, in different formats, if that applies. So I think all of this is, is, is very important in addition to, you know, the cultural and the linguistic aspects. So if you find, well, an author is very lucky to find, you know, uh, if <laughs> all these elements uh, yeah. will fall, in, fall into place, which is not usually uh, the case, but in, in, in this particular instance, yes, they fell into place. And the result I think is, is, is very brilliant. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a stunning piece of work, and I, I have it on my screen over here. And I was just looking at how short it is and how much of a punch it packs. is is quite remarkable. Um, so, uh, drawing things to a close here. During this period, have you have you been creating, or have you just been kind of getting on day to day? Uh, well, yeah, of course. I'm. Um, I think the lockdown situation. Um, uh, you know, it has these very drastic, uh, you know, sides and, uh, but also I think for a writer, it's, it's, it's like, you know, having a time off and trying to concentrate uh, on the work. John has been under lockdown for, for two months, two complete months uh, for in, in uh, March and April uh, and the beginning of May as well. So I worked on a nonfiction book, which is coming up. It's, you know, I just, signed the contract yesterday with the publisher. Okay. Uh, I also worked on um, my poetry collection, which will be uh, hopefully out uh, next year. Uh, I also collaborate, as I told you, I've been in collaboration with a contemporary dancer. This is our second collaboration. Uh, so in the lockdown situation, what has been going on is that she sends me one of her rehearsal uh, choreographies and I respond to that in text. So she makes another response and another uh, uh, choreography and so on. So I have so far four texts and she has five choreographies. So we're, we're building that into a, a body of work and we're thinking about how to you know, proceed with that. We're, yeah. we're either in performances, we're also thinking about uh, a publication that involves dance somehow as well in, other, in addition to performances. Uh, and so on. So uh, another aspect I've been working on with another publisher um, is uh, transforming uh, one of my books into a graphic novel uh, without adapting the text itself. So the text stays as it is, hmm. but then it's, it's the artist who has the burden to recreate again wow. a graphic translation, if you want, uh, of the text. So that has been moving on quite, you know, successfully. I'm, I'm very happy with what the artist is, you know, is, is definitely expanding his imagination, especially when you see, you know, uh, a visual, uh, a visual result of, of uh, a visual interpretation rather than another linguistic interpretation, but this time it's a visual interpretation of the text as a graphic novel, it's, I think is, is doing an excellent and a very creative job. So these are the three parallel projects wow. that I've, I've, or four parallel projects that I've <laughs> done. Yeah. So, so one or two things on the go. <laughs> That's really great. It, it's, it's really nice to see that there are, yeah, that there's a, an enormous amount of creativity happening 
in, in various degrees. Some people are just conserving energy uh, for, for a period when they can be creative again. Other people are just diving, diving deep into many, many different projects. So it's been a, yeah, one of the lovely things about talking to the writers and poets who have contributed to this issue is, is just to get a sense of everyone's reaction to this weird period and yeah, just seeing how quite intense. Yeah, but somehow, people. well, well, I responded to the period with a piece that has been published in, in Arab lit. It's, it's, it's a, it's a webzine for, you know, Arabic literature in translation. And uh, what I was, well, one of the angles in that piece is, is, is two things that there are other people in continuous, uh, isolation and you know lockdown like prisoners like refugees um, uh, this is one aspect of the situation and I think somehow people in zones of conflict like you know people in my area has also are also living this experiment for a long time so this was one of the main conversations I had with many people here that somehow this is the situation the normal situation of course, manifest, you know, uh, expanded somehow, but it's, it's, it's the same situation in, in, in a larger context. So somehow this did not stop, uh, you know, the productivity somehow in, in a literary sense. And also I have this idea that literature also thrives in, in, in times of crisis. I think it's yeah. the artistic response to hard situations uh, is always there and, 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 and should always be be there as well it's it's like a driver to the creative energy of, of an artist and i think this is what what happens